Good morning, everyone. We'll uh, go ahead and get started so we can stay on time. Uh, my name is Yang Chai. I want to take this opportunity to uh, welcome each one of you to the beautiful, sunny Southern California. And this is our second time uh, hosting the uh, face-based uh, annual meeting. We're really delighted to have all of you joining us. Uh, so uh, as you know, FaceBase uh, started in 2009 and with 10 spoke projects and a, and a hub, the uh, initial focus was mainly on the mid-facial region and then uh, we uh, uh, focused mainly on the human study and also the uh, um, mouse as a model for um, a facial clefting study. And then uh, currently we're uh, at the end of year four for phase space uh, two. And um, now we have expanded our coverage to the entire craniofacial complex. And then today and tomorrow, you will get a chance to hear all the progress each spoke project has been making in the past year. And then I think you will be very happy to see the work that we have been doing covering the mouse model, the human, the chimp, and the zebrafish as uh, uh, we have been doing in the past four years. And I think it's really fitting uh, as we uh, start our annual uh, meeting to uh, just uh, quickly look at what our scientific leadership group uh, uh, recommended to us at the end of our last annual meeting. And I think, you know, if you go down this list and you will see what we have done in the past year really have helped to address many of these uh, recommendations. Community participation. Uh, we have really made a strong effort to get the community involved, not only to uh, uh, come and use uh, the data at face space, but also you know, there are people now uh, uh, depositing data into uh, face space. Um, we also took advantage of uh, the Gordon Research Conference on craniofacial morphogenesis and tissue regeneration that took place back in February this year. And then we had a uh, uh, information session which was uh, well attended by people uh, at the uh, GRC. And the next three items on the recommendation spoke project interactions, uh, generating an uh, atlas, and then uh, improving animation. I'm sure uh, that you will be able to uh, see this in the uh, uh, spoke project update uh, later on today. And uh, the bioinformatic quality control and the data standard, you know, uh, uh, we have spent a lot of time working on that, and then uh, Axel, uh, and also the hub and many people in this room, Mike uh, Cherry really helped to uh, spearhead this effort uh, to make sure our RNA-seq data and cheap-seq data are all um, uh, going through the standard pipeline and then that uh, really uh, have a better quality control and also uh, uh, for the utility of that data in the future. Uh, we also have really been working with the hub, spent quite a bit of time, you know, standardize the terms used to annotate uh, our data, and also um, just to uh, make sure that uh, the data is, has a longevity at face space as we move forward. I think the last item on this recommendation list is, uh, you know, how we can facilitate the citation of data at face space. That's something I hope we will uh, spend some time to talk about tomorrow, because that seemed like uh, still a uh, challenging issue as far as you know, uh, uh, we can see in uh, people sometimes use the data and then uh, even copy the images, but you know, uh, uh, not really citing it properly. So that's something we, uh, we should really uh, discuss. And these are some of the challenging issues that we have been facing, but we are certainly not alone. As you know, I've shared with you last year, uh, NIH has multiple projects 
funded projects to uh, support this kind of uh, uh, data generation. FaceBase is one, and then uh, GoodMap, which uh, uh, has been around uh, longer than we have, started in 2005. And uh, later today, we're going to hear a talk from uh, Andy McMahon, who has been involved with uh, GoodMap since the, uh, its uh, inception. And their effort in this case is mainly focusing on imaging processing and taking, uh, looking at the human uh, gene expression during kidney development, and then uh, histology, and then also uh, uh, um, uh, gene expression. And uh, Carl and also Seth, the hub, both are uh, involved with uh, GoodMap. And the other um, consortium, the LongMap, which is also housed here at USC, or USC at least part of it at CHLA, which is uh, uh, focusing on lung development, looking at um, imaging and also uh, uh, gene expression analysis. But when you look at uh, these different projects and then uh, you know, uh, the common threads when we look at these uh, uh, data consortium is you know, how we can develop, integrate these multidimensional molecular anatomy atlas to uh, facilitate uh, discovery process. How do uh, um, I think one thing we can uh, take for granted is you know uh, if we use uh, anatomy as sort of the uh, connecting point, and everything can go back to that, and then use anatomy to uh, bring people bring different type of data together, and then uh, the users can slice it and then click and be able to find the data uh, for uh, their use. And the second point is, you know, how do we uh, get computer scientists to help us to fill some of these gaps and um, fill in the data that um, can uh, serve the people who are uh, doing uh, this type of uh, uh, research, whether it's a kidney or lung or uh, craniofacial complex. And then uh, finally, and then uh, uh, our work is really to support the discovery process and then, uh, um, more importantly, to uh, see how we can use this data to uh, uh, better have a better understanding about human disease so we can improve uh, human health. And uh, I'm sure Steve Skolnick will uh, give you an update from the NIDCR, the funding agency perspective, about Phase Space uh, 3.0. And, uh, these are some of the sort of the sort of a mission uh, statement that Larry Tabak shared with us when we first started uh, FaceSpace in 2009. And the top four, basically to promote multidisciplinary collaboration and research in craniofacial development and work to integrate genomic and phenotype data from multiple species and also uh, uh, include research on the developmental biology and genetics of a variety of craniofacial structures and then provide a large data set to uh, members of the research community. But I think, you know, uh, uh, if I can add a point to uh, uh, this list, I think whatever we do as we move forward, uh, whether it's just, you know, a spoke and the hub model or hub with uh, uh, depositing data from various research project, phase space must be a living document. You know, that's uh, people feel where they want their data to go to and they will continue to evolve to be a, uh, uh, a model in this uh, uh, modern age to uh, serve as a uh, resource for the research community. So with that, I Welcome you again to uh, USC, and I uh, like to ask Steve Skolnick to come up, and then we can hear his remarks from the funding agency's perspective.
Got it. Thanks, Yang. I appreciate it. I'd also like to start by thanking Yang, his coworkers, and the hub for putting this together. It's a lot of work, and uh, we all appreciate it. I'll start uh, with some introductions. Out. Okay. So, well, let me go to the introductions first. Uh, we have two members of the scientific leadership group here. So, Mike Cherry's over there from Stanford, and Phil Soriano's over there from Mount Sinai. And uh, we would uh, be much worse off without having them here and without getting the uh, information and feedback that we get from them. So, going to the first slide, I've been showing this slide for what, nine years now? Uh, it's still completely relevant. It's still why we're here. It's to facilitate craniofacial research by making data available to the wider community. So it is a certain, face based in a sense, is a service organization. It's also to develop the tools and the data that are needed to bring systems level biology to craniofacial development. So not one gene at a time, even though that's been very fruitful, but start to really understand this as a working living system. Now, to make a slight correction to what Yang said, we're actually in year five. We're two, year, two weeks into year five. Right. Yang has so many grants he doesn't know. <laughs> so it's really, this is the last year of these UO1s, so it's really imperative that we work hard to get everything set up and ready for face space two to become uh, history. So it, it behooves everybody to get their data to the hub and the hub to get those data Cure, you know, finish with the curation, get it uploaded, start working on integration. I got ahead of myself before, we have the SLG members. We also have some NIDCR staff here who you may have not have met, even though you've interacted with some of them. Dr. Lu Wang is back there. She's the new chief of uh, my branch at NIDCR. Emily moved on to, uh, I hope, bigger and bigger, better things, and Lou has taken uh, over leadership of the branch. And Dr. Katie Stein, any of you who have human subjects in your uh, projects know Katie through the clinical terms of award. And Lillian Chum, the division director, I think is on the webcast. So I'm gonna, I give this talk every year. I don't expect you to take notes or remember, don't memorize URLs. The, all these slides will be available uh, on the FaceBase website after the meeting. But I'll talk a little bit about opportunities for using face-based data for your own research, and this is also directed to the webcast, some funding opportunities for genetics and genomics research, and support for training. And I'll, I break out the Gabriella Miller Kids First initiative, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So we do have, Yang talked about the need to get people to work, especially informaticists, computer scientists, on uh, using face-based data, try to fill in gaps, make connections. We have an RO3, it's a larger than normal RO3, it's not the usual pittance RO3, uh, for two-year grants to encourage the quote-unquote outside use, although some of it's been inside, and to encourage people with projects, new informatics techniques, new algorithms, to try to bring data together from different face-based projects. It's a larger than normal RO3 budget, it's 200K, uh, over a maximum of two years. It used to be 300, but uh, NIH powers that BC, we can't be that generous anymore. Uh, it's not intended to support data generation, although we do allow some generation of data for validation purposes. It's really to take face-based data and use it for your own purposes and put it back into face -based. We funded a number of these projects, and I don't expect you to remember this, it'll be on the slides, but We've funded six of these projects right now. Some of the people have actually been at past face based meetings. Uh, Joan Hooper, who's actually a face based uh, PI, has had one of these grants as well. These data, uh, the products of these projects are intended to go back to face base. And you can look it up. You want to see what these people are doing other than searching their papers. You can at least see the abstracts for the ongoing grants in the NIH reporter. So remember, anything that's funded at least the abstract is now public information. So we th we'd like to see more of these funded. We'd like to see more of them coming in, but it's good to know that people are using the data. There's still an R01 FOA out there. 
uh, for our interest, you know, emphasizing our interest, interest in genetic susceptibility and variability of human structural birth defects. That's a, a, project, a FOA that we share with NICHD. Uh, we're also very interested, this is a major NIH focus on differences between male and female presentation. Uh, because, you know, remember, we always have heard for quite a while now that most studies have been done on men in their sort of middle age and left out women, children, people of uh, seniors. So there is a great emphasis at NIH for looking at biology and health across the lifespan. So this is part of it. Uh, we also have small grants outside of the face-based secondary analysis, PAR. So that's a program announcement, there's no set aside, but for analysis of genome-wide data, either for analysis of the data or using the data to develop new an analytical pipelines. And uh, we have collaboration RO3s to get people off the ground, to get basic scientists and clinical scientists and clinicians together to start to work on more integrated aspects of birth defects, biology. Now, lastly, I'll talk about this training work here. Uh, we have a variety of training opportunities for people. For instance, if you're mid-career, if you're, let's say, a developmental biologist, you want to learn bioinformatics, computational biology, this is a way to go. This will support you for that period. We also have the K99 R00s. Uh, that is a very interesting, relatively new mechanism, and some people in the craniofacial community have done very well with it. It funds the last year of your postdoc at a high level, and you carry it over to your first assistant professorship, so there's not quite the pressure to get that first R01 right off the bat. So that's a really nice mechanism. And lastly, we have uh, these admin supplements to bring the, increase the diversity of the workforce. This is another major NIH initiative. And uh, many people in my portfolio have used those, including people here. And it's a great chance to get some good people in your lab and have us pay for it on top of what you're already funded for. And Lynn King would be the person to talk to there. So just lastly, Gabriella Miller. This was an initiative that started a few years ago that uh, was congressionally mandated. It's focused on sequencing both childhood cancers in trios and birth defects trios as well. We have punched, because of the quality of our PIs, considerably above our weight here, and thanks in large part to Mary and colleagues. Uh, and we have probably, for per dollar size of institute, we probably have more samples being tr used, uh, being sequenced by this initiative than any other institute. So thank you for doing that. And the idea is you have trios for a given cohort of birth defects largely clefts in our case, uh, they will go through whole genome sequencing uh, paid for by the Gabriella Miller Initiative. You get the data. The data will also go in to a public repository run by a group out of CHOP in Philadelphia that other people can access. So if you have appropriate cohorts, Lou's going to be the person to talk to about that. All right. And the other thing is there are now, because we have the data, and just like with FaceSpace, we want to encourage people to use those data, there are now RO3 grants to uh, fund you to analyze the sequence data that are available. So BD2K, as you pro probably talked about last year, uh, it's the big data to knowledge. It's the NIH's Computational Biology Bioinformatics Initiative that went through some uh, let's politely call it turmoil a while ago. There's major changes in the way things are being run. It's still going. Carl and his group are part of it. Uh, the data commons is being worked on. There is still a pilot data discovery index trying to put an index of all types of bioinformatic data, data digital data for bioinformatic analysis into one place where you can find it which is always a challenge. And they're still running for people like me, those BD2K fundamental data science series. So now the most important slide, it's face space three. Uh, as I said before, these grants will end in just in 50 weeks. So it's now time to start thinking about what we're gonna do next. So the RFA for, is out. 
And we thought this time we'd do something a little different. So for the past nine years, face has consisted, as Yang showed you in the slides, of 10 spoke projects generating data organized around the central hub. So we thought we'd do something completely different. And this time what we'll do is we'll have 10 hubs, one spoke, Carl will run the spoke and you can drive each other nuts. All right. Uh, actually, no, it's going to be simpler than that. So it's a hub only. So when we started FaceBase, one of the reasons FaceBase was started was because if you proposed a data generating project in an R01, you got the usual not hypothesis driven, you know, not mechanistic, blah, blah, blah. And so you couldn't generate the types of data that are in FaceBase now because reviewers weren't interested in it. That's changed dramatically and for the better over the years. So many projects, I know in my portfolio, uh, have RNA-seq, chip-seq uh, type studies, uh, all kinds of assays like that, generating face-based type data sets. What face-based three will do is it will work with those groups, the RO1 funded groups, uh, that uh, funded by NITCR, NICHD, anybody who's got relevant data, and the hub will work with them to incorporate their data into FaceBase. So that will mean teaching them to use the self-curation tools, getting them access to the shared vocabulary, things like that. So instead of having spokes do that, we can now rely, since we're already spending the money on those projects for R01s, we can free up the spoke money for more R01s, which you guys can apply for. The hub will also be working with people in a way that helps them satisfy their data sharing requirements. Because NIH, as you know, is very big on data sharing, and I always bug you every time you put in an RPPR, did you share anything, please tell me about it. This is very important. So since we're generating those data, what a great way for NIDCR grantees to share their data, but through FaceBase. This is gonna require uh, Carl and crew, if, uh, if Carl is the next hub, whoever's the next hub, to go ahead and visit more meetings, talk to more people. We'll need more training sessions. So you wanna go, let's say, to developmental biology meetings, have a table, and show people how to use face space for one, because it's getting more and more sophisticated, but also talk to people about what it's gonna to take to get their data and start to coordinate with them. So that, I think, will help make it a real community resource. So it will bring the community into face space itself. So it won't be what some sour pussies say, oh, it's just a special interest group. It really will be a community resource generated by the community and orchestrated by the hub. And that's all I have to say. I'll take any questions. Good, no questions. You know I'll be here for the rest of the time, and everybody knows my email address anyway.